discuss some legal aspects of research of uh, big data, uh, which I'm pretty sure some of you have uh, come across and have uh, uh, discussed. And this is what uh, I would like to do this morning. First, let's, uh, I would like to present the problem, the issue, uh, the challenge, as you wish, and then argue that the law, the legal norms and principles, should follow the data, the life cycle of the data, the medical data in this uh, case. Uh, we, the lawyers, we have a set of, set of tools in data protection law, privacy law, informational privacy, which we call FIPS, Fair Information Practices, uh, that I will discuss some of them later on. And I will argue that uh, they are, uh, that they have this step-by-step process-based approach to the life cycle of personal private uh, data. Uh, then I will turn to medical research and see how that fits both traditional medical research and then big data uh, medical research or health related research which I believe is the future in or a new path in uh, medical uh, research and uh, I will present some data about studies of this uh, kind. So let's begin. So a person goes to his or her physician or a GP or doctor, family doctor, whatever you call it in different countries, and of course the doctor identifies the patient. So does the HMO, the health provider, uh, Maccabi or Clalit over here, or the smaller ones, or some other uh, health providers, which of course each country has a different health provide different system for providing health uh, services the NHS in the UK and and the like the data initially is ident the person is of course the patient is identified and data is collected about the person whatever whatever it is then when this data serves research it is de-identified meaning the name ID number if there is such are deleted the data is then gathered, processed, analyzed, etc. And at the end, the researchers publish whatever they do. Uh, they publish articles, books, etc. Of course, without the names of uh, the patients. So this is the you know, obvious timeline of research. And here's the question. At the end point, the data is, of course, de-identified. You know, at most, it says, we had a patient. She was, you know, 65 years old, she suffered from this and that, and this is what happened. This is the most identifying kind of information, which typically is, you know, pretty difficult to re-identify that person from such a vague publication. So, at the end point, the data is anonymous. But it's not so at the beginning point. At T1, it's identifying. So, which point should we look at? If we look at the end point, the data is anonymous, it's fine, there are no privacy issues, including under the law in different countries. But at the beginning, it is identified. So what happens there uh, uh, in between? I call these the trees and the forest. Okay? Should we look at the forest, meaning a sort of holistic way in which we would say, oh, at the end point, anonymous, or should we look at the trees step by step? And I think we should look at the trees, okay? This is the approach that I would like to advocate uh, uh, over here. So here's a typical statement that appears in a big data medical study, okay? Let's read it together. The ethics committees granted waivers of informed consent since this study involved analysis of retrospective data where all patient information was anonymized and de-identified, it's the same, prior to analysis. So it means that the researchers did approach some sort of ethics committee, and the ethics committee said, oh, go away, no need for you. We, you don't, we don't have to waste our time, your time, you are perfectly fine, because it's retrospective, and because you have de-identified the data. Does that work? So let's take a detour and then come back to medical studies. So the forest and the trees approaches here are the implications, and they're substantial. If we take 
the forest view, so we look only at the endpoint. Data protection, that is BP, data protection law doesn't apply at all, with a caveat, with a, with a comment here, as long as the re-identification is impossible. Now, if I read the paper and it says, a 65-year-old patient, ta-ta-ta, for me, it's impossible to re-identify her. However, our friends from somewhere over there, the computer scientists, they, you know, they say, okay, of course we can re-identify the person. It's not a matter of whether we can or not. It's just a matter of how long it will take us. Will it take us five minutes or ten minutes? Okay, and this is the range that they speak of. So it's a matter not of whether re-identification is possible. It is. It's a matter of motivation. Who has the motivation? Sometimes the money. Okay, it might be expensive to re-identify uh, a person, hence in most cases nobody bothers. But in some other cases it might be feasible and over time it will also become cheaper to do so and hence more people will be able and organizations will be able to do that. So it matters a lot how we conceptualize this issue. Okay? Or we can take another approach and say, okay, we realize that, yes, in the process of big data, big medical data research, privacy will be compromised. But we are okay with that as a society. Because on the greater balance of things, ta ta ta, and we conduct this trade off and say, okay, we are willing to manage, we are willing to go for it. If we do so, we should. Balance. This is a balancing process on a social sort of level, but it has to be done in, you know, in the way we do such weighty social decisions. It has to be done by the legislature. This is what the Europeans have done. Okay? So you might have heard about the GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, uh, which has been in effect now for exactly one year, minus a few days. Uh, and this is exactly what the Europeans, the EU, has done in the GDPR. They said, privacy, 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 but research, yes, we are willing to make, to have some compromises subject to some conditions, etc. In Israel, not yet. In other countries, not yet. If we take the trees approach, it means that, well, we do need informed consent, which makes it almost impossible when we are discussing studies of, you know, hundreds and thousands of people, okay? And sometimes millions of people. That is a bit difficult. We have to be very specific. And remember, the data is collected primarily for medical treatment. A patient approaches his or her physician, hospital, clinic, etc., to receive medical treatment rather than to be subjects of uh, uh, research. Hence, we have a problem with big medical data and the logic of FIPS, those fair information practices, which I will discuss uh, shortly. Okay? So, it's important. It's not just a theoretical uh, kind of, you know, uh, discussion. It has actual implications for how and what should be done. So, scholars, other scholars, privacy scholars, have um, intuitively assumed that data protection law should follow the life cycle of the data. So, Daniel Solov from GW in Washington, George Washington, uh, has offered a taxonomy of privacy and he classified privacy cases into four clusters and we see that the, th the first three of them follow the life cycle of the data. First the data is collected, then it is processed, and then it uh, is disseminated, transferred uh, to someone else, etc. Helen Nissenbaum uh, from Cornell Tech, she's a philosopher of technology, uh, she begins with the forest and only then looks at the text. Professor Nissenbaum famously offered uh, a framework which she calls contextual integrity for identifying privacy uh, issues and she instructs us to identify the social context and then within that context to search for its norms about information and specifically norms about the transmission 
of information. She is interested in the flow. So she would say, oh, the medical context, it's a context of treatment, health, primary care, etc. And then she would say, okay, what are the norms within this context about information? Who can have access to which kind of information, etc. And then she says, okay, now we have a new system or a new change, big data research. How has it changed? Okay, so it serves her to better identify what is going on. I would like to argue that uh, she's wrong, on, with all due respect, I adore her, but I disagree with her, and she knows that, uh, about, about this point. Because, especially today, it's very difficult to identify contexts. Okay? If I have uh, my dentistry treatment somewhere over there, at the medical, at the dentistry school, at the university. What is the context? Well, for me, it's, you know, I have, I need some dentistry treatment. But for the students who do that, hopefully under the supervision of someone who knows what they're doing, uh, it's, you know, it's education, it's practice, it's something else. What is the context here? If I pay, or when I pay, is it, does it become commercial? So the context is sometimes blurry, especially with big data uh, uh, issues. Hence, I think we should begin with the data itself and only then you know, see the big picture. Begin with the trees and only then see uh, the forest. Okay. Uh, following the data is justified under the view of privacy as a matter of control. Now, there are lots of theories of privacy, there are lots of controversies over here, but uh, especially the European one, and I would argue also the Israeli one, less so the American uh, uh, one at this point, is to understand and conceptualize privacy as a matter of control. I, the data subject, have the right to control my personal data. It's a matter of human dignity, okay? Nobody else has the right to control my data, data unless I agree, unless I consent. So that explains the first meeting point between ourselves, the data subjects and our data, and the data collector and data processors who want our data. They have to approach us. They have to notify us in a meaningful way. We have to be given the opportunity to consent. Okay, it's the same concept of informed consent consent. We have to understand what's going on. We have to provide our consent freely, without any pressure, after we have understood. We should have the ability to withdraw our consent at any point with no sanctions, okay? with no uh, 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 precautions uh, of, of, that, of that sort. We should be able to access our data. We should be able to call whoever processes and controls our data and say, hey, I want to meet my data again. Please let me see my data. It's not a matter of property, it's a matter of privacy, but we use the term my data. Okay? I should be able to correct that data. And at some point, if I wish, I should be able to say, you know what, delete. This is what the Europeans would say, the right to be forgotten. Okay? The entire life cycle of the data. And we add, this is part of FIPS, the Fair Information Practices, notice, consent, withdrawal, um, um, access, rectification, deletion of the data. We should also, uh, we also impose some duties on the data controllers and say, hey, you have to keep the data confidential. You have to keep the data secure from the inside and from the outside, etc. And of course, you have to make sure that all our rights are maintained. So this all derives from data, fr from, from the conception of privacy as a matter of uh, uh, control. So collection, processing, use, transfer, and the data death, this is the main points at the life cycle of the data. And the law, whether it's the GDPR or the Israeli privacy protection, to some extent HIPAA in the US, but only to some extent, they follow the, these major points in the life, lifetime, life cycle of, uh, of the data. That was FIPS, which was designed for uh, small data, 
okay, or medium data, but not for big data. When we speak of big data, just to make sure that we're on the same uh, page, I'm pretty sure that most of you know that, we typically speak about three Vs. Okay, th before we had four Ps, now it's three Vs, so lots of letters here. The three uh, Vs are volume, so it's a lot of data, that's big, okay, that's the first uh, obvious kind of meaning. The second V is variety. It means that we can take data from different sources and mix them together and they will mix. So in the medical context, it can be blood tests and CT, MRI, Rentgen, etc. And whatever the doctor has prescribed, whether it's handwritten or hopefully, you know, typed in some machine and it can be used, and this is the third V, uh, velocity, it can be used instantly. So we don't have to collect the data and then someone processes it for, you know, two years and then we have, no, it's on the spot. So lots of data from different sources processed and in, in an immediate way. Some people add, of course, a fourth V of value and others are searching for other words in beginning with V to add more characteristics to that. When huge amounts of data are collected and used on the spot, the entire idea of FIPS, the Fair Information Practices, becomes a bit dubious. How can we notify the person that we will be using their data for, well, we have no idea what for? Okay? Because the logic of big data is collect as much data as you can and let the algorithms find unforeseen, previously unforeseen connections between the data. So I might collect the data for one purpose and use it for something quite different because the algorithms suddenly found some connection. So uh, um, how much? I still have some time, okay. Uh, are you familiar with Professor Valda Shalev? Uh, do you know her? You should. Uh, so uh, you might have heard this story from her directly, but here's a second uh, kind of so so. So uh, a hearsay, so I hope I do not mischaracterize it. Professor Valda Shalev, she's a professor, she's a, a physician, a GP, family doctor, and she also has a senior position at Maccabi Healthcare Services here in Israel, the second largest uh, HMO. And here's the story I've heard from her, so once again, I hope I don't mischaracterize it. Uh, as a GP, she had a patient, and it turned out that the patient had colon cancer, and it was too late. And she said, okay, when such a thing happens, I go back to the data to see, you know, what went wrong, what, what I should have seen but, but missed. Okay, so she goes back to the data and she says, well, everything is fine. You know, all the blood tests, whatever I could see was, was okay. There was, no, there was no red light there. But she had an intuition. Now, that's an intuition. Okay, it's not, you know, it's not big data. She had an intuition that the person, the patient, there was a slight decrease in the levels of hemoglobin, I think, or one of those. Uh, and she had this intuition, and then she went to the big data she had access to in Maccabi, if I understand correctly, and called some smart computer scientists, and they played with the data, and they came up with an algorithm, which is able to predict, based on a blood test, rather than colonoscopy, which is the most avoided uh, um, um, test uh, uh, on Earth, I think. Um, um, so based on a blood test and this, you know, lots of data and the smart people from the computer science uh, department, uh, they were able to come up with an algorithm which is able to predict the likelihood of people to suffer from colon cancer. I think they speak about more than a year prior to any other indication and in better percentage. Now that is huge. Okay. She deserves the Israel Prize, if not more than that. And Maccabi called you know, people before they reached the age of 50, which is the age where they send people here to colonoscopy, I'll suggest. Maccabi called several thousand people. You know, imagine your doctor calling you and say, Hi, I'm calling because I think you should go and have the test now, even though you are 40 years old. Okay? Believe me, trust me, it's good for you. Okay? And of course, uh, the, the earlier we detect things, the better. Uh, the chances are for uh, uh, treating them uh, in, in the best way. In such a case, 
what could she have notified the users? They gave their blood tests because, you know, in Israel we do a lot of blood tests, more than I think any other country that I know of, uh, more than the US and definitely more than the UK. Uh, so there are lots of results and we do that, you know, because uh, yeah, I go to my doctor once and say, uh, let's check your cholesterol and, you know, let's check also. I gave my data for one purpose and now it's used for research. Had I been asked, I would say, of course, you know, use it if, if you know, if this can save the world, you know, you know, everybody, I believe, or most people would have said, of course. But we have not been asked, we have not been informed, okay, about this. Now, this is a good story, okay, because the research came up with wonderful, amazing results, but it could have easily come up with something else. Imagine that I'm a religious woman uh, and I oppose abortions. I'm a pro-life uh, kind of person, which, you know, you might disagree with, but, you know, that's me. And I had some miscarriages uh, in this uh, story. And I, you know, I had some medical treatment, my data was collected because of all this. Now it is being used for research which will lead to more abortions, to which I completely oppose. Had I been asked, do you agree that your data will be used for this purpose? I would say absolutely no. Okay, it's against my belief, religion and whatever. Now once again, we might disagree, but we do have to respect the wishes of such a person that her data is not included in a research which is against her morals. Okay. Uh, I've conducted my own tiny research uh, on big medical data research. I try to keep it as clean as possible to avoid as little noise. So I focused on academic research, which is non-commercial. Now, the, there's no such thing, okay. Uh, academic research, if it's successful, may definitely become commercial, but uh, and I left aside the genetics because of all the issues that have been mentioned previously, which raise a whole other set of, of issues. Um, so traditional <coughs> medical studies, as you know, were either, you know, case studies. We had a patient. This is what we diagnosed. This is what we did. She died or not. Okay. Uh, this is a typical kind of medical uh, research or clinical trials, of course, and meta-analysis of other studies that try and come up with uh, a story. In such traditional studies, the patient is or becomes a human subject and then all the ethic uh, um, conditions come into play, whether it's a Helsinki approval uh, and a university IRB, Institutional Review Board, Ethics Committee, etc., they come into play. In the big medical data, the patient becomes a human subject but immediately becomes a data subject. And because of this quick transition, the human subject element is sort of bracketed and overlooked. If the person is a data subject and it's anonymous, then data protection law and FIPS do not apply. So can we leave the middle section, the human subject, in brackets and ignore it or not? This is the question uh, we've done. So uh, I uh, looked at on PubMed uh, last year. Uh, there was a medical student who, uh, who, who had a legal background, and, but he's a medical student, so he actually understood what he was reading, unlike me. And we searched uh, to, to identify big medical uh, uh, data, big medical data studies, and we found uh, a year and a half ago only 53 studies. So obviously there's a delay between the conduction of the study and until it is published. Uh, most of them from the US and Korea, then Australia and Taiwan, and then a few others. The one uh, Israel with the UK, that's uh, Varda Shalev and her team's uh, uh, study. Most of them used governmental databases, some from hospitals, some special anonymized database. This is the case in the UK. And in one case, it was a manufacturer of some uh, uh, pacemaker device. Pacemaker, how do you call it? Uh, um, device. Uh, that provided the, the, the data. Uh, as you can see, there's an increase in the number of studies from zero or almost zero to, you know, a peak of about two dozen, 23 and 17. And once again, th there's a delay in the publication. So, but there's definitely, you know, a growth, a substantial growth in such uh, uh, studies. Most of the studies, or 23 of them, or it's not most, 23 of the studies were conducted on samples of less than 100,000 people. 
but the smallest one was of 5,469. 5, so that's pretty huge, very difficult to conduct without the use of algorithms, etc. 13 studies were about 100,000 to half a million people, 6 studies were five, uh, half a million to a million, and 10 studies was of more than 1 million people. Obviously, nothing that can be done uh, in a non-computerized uh, way. The fields, anything. Okay, so oncology, ear, nose and throat, neurology, pharmacology, whatever, you know, any field uh, uh, of the study. Ethics. Uh, uh, two more uh, uh, 27 of these studies mentioned that they have received some sort of approval of the hospital or the university IRB. Nine said uh, they had approval from some sort of a government. Uh, one from the World Health uh, Organization, it's a uh, study on Ebola in, in Western Africa, uh, and two in the UK. Eleven of them, most of them Americans, said nothing about ethics. There was no section in the article, there was just no section about uh, uh, ethics. Three said, well, we thought about it, but we don't need it. We are exempt because. Consent. 19 of them said nothing. Two said there was consent for the medical treatment, but not for the research. 13 said, well, we thought about it, but we don't need consent because it's retrospective. 20 of them said we de-identify data. This is the, their explanation or excuse for not undergoing the consent uh, process. Five of these studies, uh, the researchers have conducted the de-identification themselves which is kind of ridiculous in terms of ethics and, and privacy. Uh, the Israeli state controller uh, has published a report on privacy last week and also pointed to that issue uh, in some uh, Israeli hospitals which have conducted uh, uh, research. In New Zealand, you do provide, apparently, is there anybody from New Zealand? Uh, when you uh, join the health system, you, uh, you register with a GP. And the GP then uh, works with whatever HMO, uh, which can change. Uh, but uh, you enroll with the GP and the GP asks you, do you agree that your data will be used for research? In a broad sort of way. In Canada, they did ask for explicit uh, uh, consent. So, what does uh, all of this uh, uh, mean? And uh, I'm, I'm sort of out of time. So, uh, uh, here it is. If we take the first view, we can get away with everything. But that is that will defy data protection principles, that will defy the idea of privacy as control. We can get away with it if we conduct a social balancing process done by the legislature, but that should pass a constitutional uh, review, uh, such as uh, the GDPR in the, um, uh, in the EU. Otherwise, well, data protection should apply throughout, and that means that big data studies, which have tremendous potential, positive one, it means that such studies will be more expensive and more difficult to perform. But they will be ethical, and they will preserve privacy way better than uh, ignoring uh, the data subjects, which previously were human subjects, which previously were treated as uh, patients. Uh, you can read uh, more of that in, in this um, um, paper that I published uh, a few months ago. It's uh, freely available uh, online. And uh, that's the book that Oren mentioned for those of you who read Hebrew. No discussion of big medical data, but lots of discussion of uh, privacy issues. Thank you and apologies for taking more time. <laughs>